Welcome back, everybody, to the Victory Podcast. I am Steve McGrath, your host, alongside my co-host, Chris Haddad, as always. And today, we have another incredible guest with us. None other than Jared Odrick, who is a seven-year NFL veteran coming out of Penn State in 2009, I believe it was his senior year. At that time, he was twice a first-team All-Big Ten player, the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year his senior year, and also his senior year a consensus All-American. So drafted in 2010 first round to the Miami Dolphins, and he finished his career at Jacksonville Jaguar, or his career to this point, door is always open. We have Jared on with us. Jared, thank you so much for coming on and, and you know talking not just about your football career, but of course we want to jump into you know things you care about and what's going on now, the important things in the world. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, first we like to jump into our conversations with just sort of outlining, you know, what were you really going through when you were in high school? You know, of course you're a, a big time player. You know that you have options for where you want to play. Of course, now we know you went to Penn State, but take us back to when you're a 17, 18 year old kid trying to figure out where do you want to go? Who do you trust with your future? Well, um, I think that's tough as a 17 year old kid. Um, you know, I think it's good to, to you know, if, if you can have a good support team around you um, to help you navigate uh, everything that may or may not be coming at you. Now, I was in a unique position where I was heavily recruited from a young age. So I had an older, uh, two older guys on the team that were a year or two older than me that were running back or running back in our quarterback. And they needed a lot of tape to be pushed out in order for them to even get division one or division one double A looks. But what ended up happening is that they, in the tape, they tagged me, the freshman, uh, on the video. It's like, Hey, these are two guys we want you to look at, but also look at this guy coming up. He's a freshman. And so because of that, a lot of coaches then, like, they saw my size. By the time I was a freshman, I was, like, 6'4", like, 270, right, by the time I was a freshman. So the thing was is that, like, coaches started coming in, knocking on the door, like, uh, you know, who's that? And so um, I think when that started happening, uh, it, it increased from freshman year. Uh, Miami illegally came to visit me my freshman year uh, uh, Coach Kehoe, not to, I, I hopefully he doesn't get investigated by this, but um, <laughs> he came and saw me and he's like, oh, I didn't know that he's a freshman. And so um, what ended up happening my freshman year, sophomore year, but especially my junior and senior year, what ended up happening is that, you know, um, yeah, who was the head coach of uh, Ohio State before Urban Meyer? Trestle. Trestle. Trestle, uh, you know, all, I, I can name all the coaches, but all the schools started coming in and it started totally disrupting my day as a student. And this is where you saw that it was almost like impossible to be a student athlete, like when you start dealing with big time sports. And so um, there were a lot of coaches or a lot of recruiting coordinators that were coming in. But the thing was, is that my coach and my assistant principal was my high school coach. And so what ended up happening is that my coach his his office as a high school uh, vice principal uh, became the office for all the coaches to come through. And so I'd get let out of class like 10 times a day because I had to go to these meetings of coaches that would be coming to my school. And so teachers would hate it. Coach, like in other, there were teachers that loved it and there were teachers that hated it. There were school kids and classmates that hated it and there were school kids that loved it. And it kind of just, put me on this pedestal and kind of set me up for a type of interaction that was separated from everybody else. And so I think one of my biggest uh, struggles in high school was my socialization because you didn't know who was like really liked or disliked the fact that this experience was happening to you that was altered from all the other students and potentially teachers as well. And so um, I think it was being able to socialize as a regular student uh, after or during uh, all of those types of visitations, um, and it's 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 usually called like keeping your head on straight. What people usually say, yep. um, but it's really focusing on on what's important and what what got you to the point to even have recognition. Um, so doing that and keeping that in mind, I think is uh, is important, especially if somebody's being heavily recruited. 
Now, you played high school football in Pennsylvania. Was Penn State the school that you had kind of thought would be nice to go to from uh, an early age? Or, you know, just, I'm just curious as to, you know, why was it that that's where you decided to go? Um, well, the area I grew up in is heavy, heavily sedated with Penn State fans. Um, but, no, it's, it, there's a lot of Penn State fans that are there. And um, my mom you know, grew up in and around that. She never understood it. Uh, like she didn't, she did it. She just thought it was very cultish. And so uh, she didn't want me to go there simply because everyone around us was like eyes glazed over about Penn State. And, but what ended up happening throughout the recruiting process, so my final five schools were Virginia, Virginia Tech, Florida, Georgia, and Penn State. And the reason Penn State stayed on there uh, was because of a coach named Larry Johnson. And Larry Johnson is now the D-line coach at Ohio State, uh, but he was at Penn State for like close to 20 years or something like that. And um, when he recruited me, he came in with a plan. He saw a vision that I didn't see um, for myself. And he laid out a plan. He saw exactly what was going to happen. He's like, if you are the same person you are here, and I can expand upon that when we get you at Penn State, you will, you will be... Uh, now, there's a few things we didn't accomplish in this plan. He's like, I think you'll be uh, a freshman All-American. Um, he goes, you'll be uh, 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 by your sophomore year. By the end of your sophomore year, you'll be an All-Big Ten player. Junior year, you'll be an All-Big Ten player. You'll be an All-American. You'll graduate from Penn State, and you'll be a first-round draft pick. Like, and, he's, and there were other things in between there where it talked about you'll get this degree, you'll do this, you'll do that. And he had this whole plan laid out. And but he connected it to who I was at that, that point in time. And there was no other coach that laid out such a vision um, or spoke so, so motivatingly. Um, and I think that was my biggest decision because my mom didn't want me to go to Penn State. She's like, go somewhere else. Go, like, go be different. Go further. Go farther than what everybody else is, is telling you to do. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But when I go further, like, I don't feel like the way he makes me feel like he makes me feel like I can, I can do anything. And I think it's following those people that make you can feel, make you feel like you can do anything as long as it's pointing you towards your actual goals. So, and I think that's what coach Jay provided. And that's why I went there. Awesome. Yeah, awesome yeah. Essentially a, a how to for recruiters right there. But uh, yeah, Jared, I just wanted to fast forward a, a couple of years, you know, you may not have checked every box on that list that, the coach had provided for you, but you do ultimately become a first round draft pick and you go to Miami. I have to imagine being a first round pick that comes with a lot of weight on your shoulders, trying to live up to expectations that all the fans and the organization has for you. How did you adjust from being this, you know, division one football player to now first round pick all this money that's put into your hands, all these expectations that are placed on you, how do you mentally deal with just making that jump now to being around grown men and having this be a full-time job? Well, I think, you know, similar to from high school to college, what we're talking about with automation, like it's, it's, it's trying to lay the basic groundworks of, okay, this is the new setting and this is what I need to do in order to find success in the setting. It's, it's reprogramming what you need to do to find success. Um, and, I think that was tough, and especially in a place like Miami, right? I think it's different. I think my career would have been different with the type of personality that I am uh, if I would have landed in Green Bay. Now, I may have found things to entertain myself, but in Miami, they they roll right up on you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's usually packed in a nice, tight pencil skirt. But it's... Um, yeah, it was it was difficult, but I think what ended up happening, like so, when I was drafted, I had one agent, uh, Peter Schaefer, and then after I was drafted, and I got to Miami. I realized, like, I'm gonna since I'm like I don't have a girlfriend, I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, my mom's not moving down with me, I don't have friends that are living with me. I'm gonna need somebody here, and there was an agency that was recruiting me that had a team of people all in one area, which was Miami, and that was Drew Rosenhaus. And Drew Rosenhaus had a team of people 
of runners and people beneath him and his brother who ran the agency that would um, that would get me like protein shake deals. It would get food delivered to my house that would get my car cleaned or serviced that would pick up my parents or anybody coming from the airport. It automated all of these things that would otherwise be stressors on my mind to think about because now I have this career and I have access to things and I have money and I have this and that. So it's like I picked the, the group of people. And so I fired my agent. I fired Peter Schaefer after I got drafted, which his wife wrote me a very, very uh, nice letter uh, <laughs> telling me how great of a person I was for doing so. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought it was really interesting to, to send that to a 21 year old. Uh, but anyways, um, she yeah, she wrote me a, 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 a nice review and then um yeah i continued with firing him because he wasn't there to able to, to help me in my physical space that i needed help with and it made a lot of logical sense even if it didn't make se sense to the commitment that was made but there's yeah. and but that's a forewarning to anybody that's continuing with football like there's there's a lot of people in a lot of different situations whether it's agency and player or whether it's program and player or uh, or uh, franchise and player, uh, that the idea of commitment and something that is above the idea of money takes a hold of the relationship when it's not that at all. When, it's, when it is about money, um, but you don't want to introduce that idea into your head early on. So I'd say find a group of people that can help you do what you need to do in your space to help further your career towards your goals. And I think it's the same thing that we said about in high school. And it's the same thing about going into the pros. It's, it's having a group of people that help automate the things that, that uh, don't necessarily help you with your career, like picking up people at the airport. Yeah. Now, now how much does the, the Miami dolphins as a, as an organization help you with that? Because we had Dan Orlovsky on the podcast and he said one of the hardest things for him was moving up to Detroit. Uh, as a 21, 22-year-old kid, never been there before, and all of a sudden he has to grow up, right? So how, how much does the Dolphins help you get acclimated? I mean, you mentioned it too, on top of learning a playbook, on top, on top of bonding with your teammates. I mean, there's a lot to go on for a 21-year-old. And I say kid in a sense that you're still young and still trying to figure out the world. Um, how much does the organization help you out as well, or are you kind of on your own? Um, I think every organization is a bit different, but I think – the Dolphins, I think, uh, showed me from very early on that it's like you're on your own type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was somebody, I'm not sure if he was there my rookie year. I think he was. Yeah, he was definitely there my rookie year because I went through my rookie program with him. Uh, Caleb Thornhill was a huge help, and he's been with the Dolphins still developing guys. He was the uh, director of player development. Okay. And not every director of player development is created equally. He is definitely a guy that is going to be up and beyond what that what that position asks for, because what that position traditionally asks for is a former player to kind of be hate to say it, but it's literally the position of like overseer. And I'm not sure if you know what overseer is, but that's on a slave plantation when it's like, hey, boy, get back in line type of thing mm -hmm. where they kind of if a guy shows up late or doesn't show up for practice it's like that's the guy who goes and gets them right gotcha. if a guy is having issues with the team or a coach or whatever it is that's the guy that goes talk to them it's like hey hey i'm a black guy that did what you did like listen to me right so i think that's what ends up happening but caleb was so different in that he actually wanted to empower individuals and what he started doing in implementing the rookie success program uh which i think every team has to have, but once again, they're not all created equally. Um, Caleb started introducing the ideas of empowerment, but that was something that I was even resistant to as a first round pick. Cause it's like, the fuck are you trying to empower me for? Like, I just, they just gave me $7 million. Like, yeah. like I'm doing the right thing, obviously, yeah. but you don't recognize until you go through some of the motions of where your brain actually starts to open up to other ideas that, Oh shit. Like I really appreciate what he's doing or what he's done. Um, so yeah, uh, the Dolphins. When I when I got when I got the call in the green room at the draft at Radio City Music Hall, it was like, "Hey, uh, Jared, this is Jeff Ireland." I'm like, "Oh, hey, what's up? What's going on?" And he's like, "Uh," and he was like stalling to say something. Like it was like, "Oh, uh, hey." Uh. So what I I eventually found out was that they were they were trying to trade the pick before they made it official. Ah, oh, okay. But they were already on the phone with me, mm -hmm. and so it was like, uh, uh, uh. 
And then, like, three minutes later, it's like, well, okay, uh, you want to be a dolphin? <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> Do I have a choice? Yeah. <laughs> and so they're like, yeah, well, you know, welcome to Miami. And I'm like, oh, great, cool. Like, but in the middle of that, you're not actually picking that apart where it's like, do they actually want me? It's like, oh, fuck. Like, I'm yeah, I'm a dolphin. Yeah, I'm in the NFL. So, so then what usually what I always saw happens is that they fly their first round pick down, do a press conference, hold up a jersey, shake the owner's hand or the GM's hand and do all that. Well, I, w- I said, hey, you know, when am I coming to Miami? They're like, yeah, uh, just show up for rookie mini camp. <laughs> and I was wow. just, oh, okay. All right. Well, and I didn't know. I'm like, is that normal? And I asked my agent, like, what is, why aren't they flying me down? Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? And so automatically I felt like it's like, <laughs> did they even want to pick me? <laughs> like, right. yeah, did they right. pick the wrong guy? <laughs> like, and so I just thought that was really funny how that started off my whole career uh, was like they were trying to trade the pick, but ran out of time. And uh, and so I felt like that and the not having the press conference, but then also getting there and then especially when I broke my uh, I broke my leg. I fractured my leg the first game after yeah. I had the first tackle for loss. I'm like, yeah, I fucked up C.J. Spiller in the backfield. Two plays later, I, I, I fractured my leg, which I actually fractured before in college. I come back six weeks later, right? But in between that, when I fractured my leg, I got a note in my locker from uh, Jeff Ireland, right, that said, hey, we drafted you in the first round for a reason get back on the field. No kidding. It was after I fractured my leg. Yeah. Yep. So I come back six weeks later because we're about to play the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I'm like, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, that's where I'm from. Everybody's going to be watching this game. So I got to come back. Well, that week I get pumped up with a bunch of drugs uh, and toward all that I take willingly because I, most people are ignorant towards what they do to you. Um, And I started practicing that week on a fractured leg. And I wasn't looking good, even though everybody was telling me that I was. And uh, two practices in that week, I break my left foot because I'm compensating. I didn't plant on that right leg yep. to break my foot. And so the GM didn't speak to me for the rest of the year. And if he saw me in the training room, he would ignore me. No kidding. Right. And so, um, so the thing was is that, yeah, you realize that you are on your own if you have yep. nothing to offer them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's um, – I was reading a story earlier this week and – I don't know how valid it is, but it was on uh, the Tennessee Titans and how uh, Taylor Lewan had a concussion. And Vrabel went to him and said, hey, you're going to set out this week. And Taylor was like, no, I'm ready to play. He's like, no, like we need you for the long run. So, I, I mean, that's just a complete opposite end of the spectrum where the head coach went to his essentially best left tackle and said, hey, we're going to keep you out this week. You know, but to that's make also the story that you hear about. Of course. Of course. Right. Yep. Yep. So, uh, segue from that, you end up in Jacksonville. Um Gus Bradley set the foundation, I guess, for what is is there today. Uh, Marone and Coughlin are in there now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the defense? You were part of it as well. and What made the defense so special like it is today? Well, I think it's it's getting the right pieces in place for the defense. Yep. Um, and I think they were slowly building that. And I think, uh, um, you know, uh, Marone always had the right – sentiment towards approaching the game of football i think uh i think a lot of people like the way that he approached he was always a guy's guy which is something that we continually say every year is is a dying breed um but he's a guy's guy um and uh and i think uh d coordinator i always want to say todd bowles but it was it was todd who's the d coordinator there bald head looks like he was my D he was my D line coach, and I can't even think of his fucking name because there's so many coaches in my mind now. But anyways, Todd Wash. Um, I think Todd Wash is 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 a is a really good defensive coordinator um, in terms of motivating guys to play. Um, it was just when I when I had first got there, you know, Bob Babbage. See, Bob Babbage, and he was a D coordinator, but then also. Uh, who the head coach was, was uh, Gus Bradley. They kind of mirrored each other in terms of their sentiments that they were like such great guys, Mm -hmm. but they weren't great football coaches. And I think that's one of the things is is that they were great guys and, you know, and they had compassion. And a lot of times when you're a leader of men that have this physical objective, compassion is good to have, but it's not one of the leading principles 
of leading a, a team to go do something physically damaging to other people. And I think uh, in the way that you think, everything trickles down from your leading principles. And compassion was definitely up there for Gus. And that's why he's one of my, my favorite coaches uh, or my, one of my favorite people that I came across in football, but definitely not one of the best coaches. Sure. Now, he knew a lot about football, mm -hmm. but I think in terms of being a head coach, I don't think that his compassionate personality was best fit for that. Um, but in terms of a man, I think he's a great man. Um, and I think that's kind of, it kind of highlights just in saying that it highlights like, uh, like how you can be a great man, but not a great football player or football coach. Uh, within the game of football and how you can be a shitty man and still be a great football player, or a great football coach. Yep. Um, you know, obviously we want to try to find both, but I think what ended up happening with that defense is finding the right places or the right pieces to fit that defense, that it is, is it, it's successful if you have the right players running the right schemes, moving the bodies the way that they're best fit to move. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's something that you saw with, like, Calais Campbell. You know, I played that position, and I'm only now, and me not being on the field, realizing how many things I actually wasn't being able to use. Like, my left foot was stuck, my right hip was this. But I think Calais Campbell, and the way that he moves, perfectly fit that position. And, and like, when you look at a guy like uh, uh, Jack, Miles yeah, Jack, Jack, yeah, yeah. Like, if you look at him, he, we, we call that bad body. He doesn't have an impressive body to him. And like, there's nothing really overly impressive about him. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is that him and that body type and the way he moves fits that defense. Right. And I think a lot of people don't understand how imperative it is for people to use great players within specific schemes that give the most it can to a scheme and that you can suck the most out of a player by specific schemes. And that takes placement. And I think there's a lot of people that don't recognize that, that there's a lot of linebackers over Ray Lewis's career that were better than Ray Lewis, but Ray Lewis had the perfect meshing of a defense that highlighted him. And then the personality that grabbed all the attention. Yeah, now, how many guys do you think are, are caught in a, in a bad scheme? And, and like, do you think, Tons. Tons. Do you think that you think it's a ton? Yeah. A lot. I think, I yeah. think, I think, I think a majority of the league are ridiculously talented athletes and players. Sure. Yep. Whether they're caught in the right scheme or wrong scheme. I think that's the dividing line. Yeah. Is whether like we're using you properly or not. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about that too. Like there's gotta be, cause if, when you, once you're at the NFL level, like I think most of it's scheme, right? So if, I can only imagine how many bad, like good players are just either behind someone who's starting or even caught in a bad scheme and just have that bad luck. Now, there's a lot of like just absolute freaks that would be good at whatever they do, but you also sure. see that there's a, a range even within the freakonomics of this person uh, being the freak that they are. Like Julio Jones is going to be Julio Jones wherever you put yeah. him, yep. right? But the thing about Julio Jones is that if you have a Matt Ryan, like you're holding you. yeah. Jones times 10. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. It's like, well, you need the right pieces in place and you need the right, just like you need the right owner. You need the right GM. You need the right two head coaches. You need the right schemes. You need the right quarterback to align for your career to blossom and bloom. And it also comes back down to an individual level, what you're doing. But I think there's a lot of people that are held back because they're not in the right situations. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Absolutely. Now, Jared, I want to ask you just one last question about actually playing football before we, we talk about some of uh, the things you've been up to more recently. Uh, I just I, I feel compelled to ask you because you, you know you you were such a dominant athlete. You know how did someone that played at the highest level? You know, you pretty much if you're going to rush the passer, you're going to go power move. Or you're going to go speed move. Over the course of your career, even if you want to look back at, at Penn State, how did you? build those different moves? How did you decide when you wanted to use them? You know, was it almost play by play? Is it more, you know, the guy that's lined up against you and spending that time in film understanding who you're going against? I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about that. Well, there's different, there's different factors that come into your mind throughout the week when you're preparing for an opponent, whether you're talking about a team or an individual that's going to be across from you. Um, there's certain teams that move certain ways. So it's like, so yeah, there's speed, there's a speed rush, there's power rush. And that usually 
uh, you can predicate that off of, okay, um, you know, I'm going to power rush because I'm on the interior line and this guy is 200 and this center is usually centers are the weakest blockers. And if I'm playing a zero or a one over top of the center and he's 282 pounds and he's the backup uh, center because their first center got hurt. Well, I'm going to do as much as I can to power him and to power and to power him and then to get him to fall into, into me because he's so worried about how light he is in the ass. And so there's different things where it's like, okay, well, that's position and depth chart, but then it's also knowing that my matchup across from me is lighter and understanding that he's probably going to overcompensate at times. So if I really continually get him to use his strength and to get his lower body weight to lean into it because he doesn't have the strength, so he has to use as much body weight as possible, well, then that's when I know that I can kind of, it's not speed, it's more of a finesse where it's like getting him to lunge forward and then kind of... Yeah, a leverage, a leverage play, sure. Yep. And so, so you can think about that, but then there's times where there's a whole week dedicated to rushing the pass or rushing Tom Brady is totally different than rushing, uh, you know, when we prepared to play like RG3 or something like that. Like it's a total, like Tom's not going to run out of the pocket. And if he runs out of the pocket, he's not running far. Right. So we're not going to play for the scramble. We're going to play for the pocket. So what we do is, you know, a lot of guys will push and collapse the pocket right? Collapse the pocket or at least get him off the mark. So we'll have one guy that is designated to either finesse or speed rush. So if you go around the edge as a defensive end, you push Tom up in the pocket, right? But if you go up and under, you push Tom out of the pocket as a defensive end. So the thing is, is that we have one speed rush guy going around the end and push Tom up. Well, then our interior guys are going to do nothing but power rush. So there's different ways, like even if your guy's 330 pounds, right, that you're going up against on the interior, you're still going to power rush based upon how that quarterback moves and the way that offensive scheme is. So there's multiple variables that come into how you decide how you're going to rush. Um, but then there's times where it's like I said, situationally, it's like, okay, the, the, uh, I'm playing against the Falcons and they're down 16 points and, you know, it, there's 12 minutes left in, or 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. Well, if it's third down, I'm pinning my ears back and I'm rushing every time. Yeah. I'm going to make them beat me with draws and screens, right? It's like, okay, well, if it's draw and screen, you better run that and you better run it well because I'm pinning my ears back and I'm hedging my bets. So even if it's a speed offensive tackle, it's like, okay, if I pin my ears back and, I, and, and there's a, a – they call them dancing bears when they're like offensive tackles that can actually move. Well, if I got a dancing bear on the outside and I know that he's going to be able to keep up with my speed rush, it's like, all right, well, then I'm going to take him up. I'm going to take him up. I'm going to take him up. Then all of a sudden I'm taking him up and then boom, I counter with the power or I counter inside. Um, and there's so many variables that go into it. When you end up talking about it, uh, you know, it's a simple game, but it, there's, there's complex ways of, of, of looking at it. So it's, it's like, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, there's so many variables that goes into what a pass rush is, but it's kind of like trying to pick one or two variables that you're going to play off of that end up allowing you to play faster. Sure. Of I think that's great for our young, young listeners too, to be able to understand yeah. that. Yeah. Chess match. It is. Yeah. The trenches. Um, so Jared, I, you know, of course we know that your last season playing in the NFL was 2016. And since then, uh, hold on, you real know, quick, real quick. I don't yeah. mean it. But to go no, back, please. To make it simple, to make it really simple. But if you have something like, if you're Khalil Mack, or if you're somebody that has something that you do very, very, very well, don't abandon that. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, don't abandon it. Get better at it and keep it this this weapon, right? That you can do, whether it's a speed rush, power rush, long arm, right? Trap, trap, whatever it is, swim, whatever it is, like do that and bludgeon them to death with it. And then switch it up. So don't abandon what you do just simply because of what this other team is presenting until it fails you. So, sorry. That's awesome. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to ask next is, you know, very obviously you're a, an eloquent speaker. You're a thoughtful guy. And you've been able to use 
you know, your talents as a person and funnel that into different things, whether it is writing, you know, who do you cheer for? Or, you know, I, I saw also that you've uh, been an executive producer on three short films. You know, you have a lot of, you know, creative abilities. How do you go about channeling, you know, that into actually producing something? And, you know, just for example, the, the who do you cheer for was a very thought out piece that really brought to light things that, you know, me as a, a big football fan, uh, I was kind of unaware of. I mean, we hear about Colin Kaepernick or, or Eric Reed, but we don't necessarily hear about anyone else that's involved in these types of conversations. So, uh, not that I necessarily have a very good question, but I wanted to just sort of give you the stage to talk about really w what you care about it and how do you go about articulating it? Um, well, I, I actually, I, I just did a, a talk, um, a conversation with uh, a former sociology class that I had at Penn State with Sam Richards. And it was about 800 kids. I think you put that on Twitter or Instagram. I, I definitely just saw that. Yeah, that I was able to... Uh, that I was able to speak with them. And it was, it was a great opportunity because I was able to communicate with people that are really trying to use their heads and, and, and figure out how to perceive the world. Um, and I, and I was thankful for that, but a part of that post that recap that interaction, I, I had said, you know, I think that this whole Kaepernick thing and the, when people kneel or the energy that's behind it, I think it's, it's the same energy when you sit there and you talk about, uh, you know, you're writing this article and you're producing this and you're doing that. There's the energy behind the movement to kneeling. I think for a lot of guys is because they sense that there's something wrong or off or that there is a discrepancy somewhere, but they don't have the articulation to be able to voice that. So the least that they can do is kneel, right? Is that they can make a motion towards saying, I don't know, but here's something I don't know, but yeah, I'm with Cap. Like, they're not articulating anything. A lot of guys who are kneeling, like, you know, now the Kenny Stills are a bit different, you know, but then what happens then? Well, then they go see what Cap's saying and they go see what Eric Reed's saying and then they kind of repeat that. It's not because they thought it themselves. They just know that there's a, an energy behind, like, yeah, I see black people being shot. I see black men being treated differently um, than other men in our society so and they may have felt that growing up or they may have seen other people uh within their family or friends that have been treated differently within society not always just violence with guns and cops but uh just the idea that there is a difference and i think sometimes that you know that energy can lead somebody to make an action a physical movement which i think football is the expression of energy i think football is an art and it is an expression like all sport is but it's through movement and i think it's kneeling is literally mirroring what the football player is doing as an artist is using physical motion void of words and articulation in order to express a feeling and i think that's what kneeling is kneeling is an extension of the same person that is playing football so it makes sense to me that players would kneel, but then not really say anything. And so what I said is, is that I think players kneel when they don't know what to say. And then I think players that continue standing, well, they'd rather stand and keep everything the same as to the point when, like from when they started playing football to where they got to where they wanted to be as a professional football player, because they'd rather identify as a world-class football player than as an undereducated activist. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like I kneel. It's like all of a sudden I have to have a reason for kneeling. But if I stand, I don't need a fucking reason. I can stand and still stand upon. Well, you know, uh, you know, football is like the mics aren't coming into my face if I stand. So it's this subliminal uh, incentivizing of not causing emotion. Now, I'm not saying it's incentivizing to to not be an activist or incentivizing to not. Uh, think a certain way on certain civil rights, but it is incentivizing solidarity, right? Because you've been rewarded for that solidarity and it's rewarded you. It's allowed you to get to the point that you're at, to have the platform that you do have. So why would I kneel when I can't articulate something as an activist or I don't know the history of the plight of black people in multiple areas, right? Even though I am a black person, 
or a majority of the league at least is saying this to themselves. It's like, well, you know, as a football player and, you know, disrupting all of this, it almost feels disrespectful to the game, even though it's not. It feels disrespectful to the game because the game is giving you so much and that you this is a part of the process of the order that has allowed me to get to this point. There's so many guys that like are filled up with emotion before a game during the national anthem. Right. And it's not so much that they're thinking country. I think that's the time that everything is reflecting upon uh, or everybody's re reflecting upon what has led them up to this point where they get to go out and fucking do something that everybody else in the stands and on TV is watching that they don't get to do. Mm -hmm. That this is an awesome opportunity as these three fighter jets fly across and rumble all of our chests before we play in this game, right? There's a real visceral feeling to that. And I think by kneeling, it's almost like you're saying, yeah, I feel that. I see all this emotion. I feel all that. And boom, here I am kneeling, right? Now I'm putting all of that and I'm taking that energy away from you, you know, and from that feeling and I'm putting it into this kneeling. So you hopefully see that I see the power of, of what is that pregame ritual of playing, uh, paying allegiance to the flag or pledging allegiance to the flag. And I want you to start to, to use that same energy and that emotion, whether positive or, or positively or negatively towards kneeling uh, or towards what I'm kneeling at or towards or whatever that is. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think there's a lack of articulation. And I think the energy behind me doing things like producing movies or uh, uh, trying to write uh, on certain projects and other films and uh, TV shows or uh, me trying to write about CTE and me doing, uh, I'm currently in the process of uh, making a documentary about CTE um, and what I actually think it is. And I think all of that is the same energy that makes a player want to kneel, to invest in an alternate narrative of their own experience. And I think that kneeling is just a tipping of the iceberg of recognizing that you're an individual. And I don't think, sure. and I don't think that there's a lot of players that recognize themselves as an individual. I think they have lip service towards themselves as individuals. But how can you build a morality or a moral compass separate from the game when the game has given it to you the whole time. Like I didn't create what the moral compass of a good defensive lineman should be. It was kind of laid out before me, like yeah. what in my schedule and what I should do and the principles that I have and me feeling welled up with emotion at the, the, the pledge of allegiance um, or the national anthem. And there's so many things that are kind of laid out before me. And I think, I think the kneeling, is such a disruptive thing because all of those people that are in the sport and all of the people that view the sport have always seen it as a collective sport, right? It's one of the most collective sports there is. Now, basketball is totally different where it's a collective sport, but there's it's a group of individuals. Yeah. Where football, it's a group of faceless soldiers. Where it's like there's, at any time, there's like six Williamses on the field. Like, like... <laughs> all with the same name on the back and a variance of numbers and you can't see their faces. And it's actually a relinquishing of an individuality. It's a relinquishing of, of individuality and personality, especially when you have the face mask, right? And I think there's so many factors that go into, like when, there was, when there's any type of display of individual effort or individual thought, that's what really disrupts this cohesive idea of football, both as the player uh, or the spectator, meaning like the owner or the team manager, the general manager or whatever. It's like, it's a part of, it's within the, the incubus of, of football or even the spectators. It's, it's a jolt to see somebody having morals different or separate from the game that has given them so much. Sure. It certainly, uh, you know, really makes a player question who they are, what are they doing? How do they voice that? You know, do they voice it or is it just physical? And uh, I think you said it best, it's the tip of the iceberg. And it's uh, hopefully, I don't think it will be quick, but it at least should start having more conversations, momentum being gained toward really think, covering ground. And I think that's one of my biggest, one of my biggest uh, critiques 
of Eric Reed and Kaepernick is that I don't think they're speaking enough. Um, I think, you know, they have this platform and I think now they're protecting it as opposed to continuing to speak and articulate of what they want to actually see change. Because I don't think any of us really know what a revolution looks like. I think we're all a part of lip service towards a revolution and changing ourselves and changing our collective and our inner subjective ideals. But I don't think anybody really knows what to do in terms of a revolution, especially when you start reinvesting in the idea of being sponsored by Nike. So I think there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of different things that are swirling around if we're talking about Eric Reed and Kaepernick, but then just the idea of individualism. Um, and I think, the kneeling, when you start talking about Eric Reed and, and Kaepernick and why we hear about them, but not other players like myself or anybody else who may have opinions or, uh, or you know, a desire for discourse. Um, I think those opinions are easily, I don't want to say the word manipulated, but steered towards a national agenda and monetization. Mm -hmm. um, when you start to use common sense and personal responsibility and speaking about being an individual, it's not as monetizable as saying, you know, this whole group of people is oppressed and we're doing this and we're doing that and it's racism, racism, racism. When you, racism to you, racism to you, racism to me looks different from all three of our perspectives. Yep. What you sure. think is racist, is not what you think is racist, is not what I think is racist, but it might be what this person think is racist. Yeah. When you take a platform full of subjectivity, meaning like it looks different to every one of us, well then it's literally, and I hate to say it, but it's literally taking the, 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 the podium of like what God said, right? Because it's subjective. And so you can then bend the narrative towards whatever you want it to be. It's not objective. It's like, well, where did they produce this racism? Where are the raw materials for it? Can we put a tariff on somebody who's producing it? Can we stop it dead in its tracks? No, you can't because yes. it looks different to everybody and it will transform. Every time that you create a new policy, it will transform. And we're like, oh, we thought we ended racist, racism before. You can't end it because it's not a real visceral thing. So that's my issue with taking the podium as, as, uh, as with racism is that if you don't make it objective, then it can continually be your platform forever. Right. And it, Jared, quite obviously, th this is a, a longer conversation that you know we would really like to have. Uh, unfortunately, for right now, we, we kind of have to cut it off because of, we, we have to jump. Um, we'd love to have you on to discuss it further and get into CTE, but uh, we have a, a little bit of a time crunch for right this second. So I'd like to just uh, – I don't mean to cut you off, but just I, I so we it. could – I'm long-winded. <laughs> and I love it. it it's just, uh, unfortunately, yeah, it's this is tough. one of those few yeah. times that we uh, we uh, have to jump to make another obligation. Think football, um, think football, think football. Think football. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, but if you could readjust, I need you to let me know what is most important in the football world, having the number one offense or the number one defense? Uh, I mean, if you want to make money – offense if you want to win championships defense fair enough if you can only play one the three four the four three me personally i love playing a four three three technique i love being the three because you're 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 the fucking guy you're you're allowed to do whatever the fuck you want the whole yeah. defense will run off of you and that's what i experienced at penn state so going from four three D tackle at Penn State being the guy at the defense to the three, four defensive end where you're just the guy. It, it was just, it, it wasn't the greatest. Yeah. Uh, you've already mentioned uh, guys being in the wrong scheme, so it makes sense. Yeah. Um, did you have one or even uh, multiple pregame rituals that you stuck to? Um, yeah. Uh, 50 cents, I'll whip your head. <laughs> Nice. Because uh, I always felt like I was about to go rob somebody, whether it was like the team that I was playing against or whether it was like the Dolphins, like for giving me a check at the end of the week. You know, I'm about to go rob somebody like somebody's going to give me that, you know, motherfucking paycheck. You know? so it was like um, I whip your head. Um, so there was like certain songs like of albums that I was feeling during that time that I would play. But I always come back to whip your head. 
um, yeah, that stuck pretty well. I can't wait to blast that in the gym later today. Yeah. <laughs> Which would you prefer if you could only have one, a strip sack or a pick? Um, is the strip sack, do I recover the fumble or are we just ending it at that? No. Sure, you recover the fumble too. Yeah, strip sack, recover fumble. Because it, 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 you get an interception as a defensive lineman, it doesn't make you a better D lineman. It's more fluke than anything. Sure. Strip sack makes you a better D lineman. Uh, is there one coach or player that you wish you would have had the chance to play with? Yeah, I said no to Bill Belichick. Um, I think he's one guy that I would definitely wanted to see how he operated. But from what I saw and felt at the Patriots facility when I visited, because uh, I would have that's where I would have played for my eighth year. Um, I just, I couldn't do it. Like I got offers from Patriots, Jets, uh, Eagles, um, which are all really good teams, but I said no, but I, I definitely would have, I think it would have been interesting if I would have been inside the, the house of the house of bill for a year. Definitely. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, last one before we let you go. What's most important? I think I know you're going with this. The players or the scheme? The players or the scheme? Yes. What's well, the players in the scheme? <laughs> um, and so I think I think it's a combination of both. It's the players in the scheme, but I, you you can't. I want to say you can't do anything without the players. But there's good players and there's shitty or there's shitty players and good schemes that do well, but. I mean, I'm always going to side on the side of the players because that just bodes well for them making more money than the other time or the other the other side of it. Because if it's all scheme, then they've got no reason to pay players. So players. Awesome. Cool. Uh, well, Jared, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking to us. Obviously, we, we want to continue this conversation. Uh, but for right now, we want all of our listeners to know they can find you on Twitter at Jared Audrick on Instagram. Search Jared Audrick, but I think your handle is Max Bear seventy five. Max Bear, yeah. I I I I take a lot of breaks from Twitter because uh, I I think it's bad for people. But um, Instagram, yeah, Instagram. Instagram. Awesome. Well, Jared, thank you so much for coming on. We yeah, really thanks, appreciate sir. it. Thank you for.